بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد dear brothers and sisters in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome to this new episode of Ask Huda broadcasting to you live from Jeddah, Saudi Arabia and you will find the numbers as usual inshallah displayed at the bottom of the screen so if you have a question go ahead and call and we will try to answer it insha'Allah. Uh, Doti has a question uh, sent by the email. He says, is it true that if you don't do something which is wajib in salat, your salat is valid, but you have a sin for not doing that wajib? In a nutshell, no, this is not true. If a person does not do something that is wajib, meaning obligatory, then he has committed a sin if he had done this intentionally and his prayer is invalid. However, if he dropped this wajib unintentionally or due to forgetfulness or because he was ignorant, in this case he has to compensate this during salat by offering sujood as-sahu, the prostrations, the two prostrations of forgetfulness. Now having said that, it has to be clear to all Muslims that Salat is composed of pillars that if you leave intentionally or unintentionally and could not make them up, then your prayer is invalid. Regardless, someone prays Asr, three rak'ahs, and remembers after a few hours, his prayer is invalid, totally. He forgot the sajda and did not remember except after half an hour, his prayer is invalid. The second thing is mandatory acts. If a person abandons an obligatory act of salat or a, 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 a mandatory act, such as, for example, saying Subhana Rabbi al Azim in Ruku' or Subhana Rabbi al A'la in Sujood or the first Tashahud in a three or four rak'ah prayer, he stands up without doing the Tashahud. If he does this intentionally, then his prayer is invalid. If he does it out of forgetfulness or out of um, ignorance, for example. Uh, in this case, he has to compensate this with two prostrations of sahu, uh, depending on the situation, whether before salam or after salam. And if he forgets to do the sujood sahu, his prayer is valid. The third component is the sunnah, such as raising the hands when saying Allahu Akbar, or putting your right over the left on the chest while in a standing position. These are sunnah acts. If you do them, you're rewarded, and if you skip them altogether, intentionally, your prayer is valid, and there's no sin on you. Madhar says, according to Islam, is it okay to read horoscopes without believing in them? And the answer is no, this is totally prohibited. When someone goes or by himself reads material that predicts his future, that tells him this would happen to you in a week time, in a month time, in a year time. He is one of two. Either he has strong belief that this is true and that person or this uh, magazine or the fortune teller is saying the truth and he knows the future. So whoever believes in that, he's a kafir. He has nullified his Islam. Because no one knows the future except Allah Azza wa Jal. No one knows al-ghayb except Allah the Almighty. The second person is a person who knows that this is a lie. And he's just there for the fun of it. So he goes to a fortune teller, to a soothsayer, to a priest, to uh, uh, anyone who claims to predict your future by reading your palm, by reading your coffee, 
uh, Turkish coffee after you finish it and they can tell by reading the marks and the drawings on the sand by flipping uh, uh, oysters or things of the seashells and uh, predicting your future through it you're just doing it for the fun of it well the punishment for that fun is that Allah would not accept the prayers of 40 days though you don't believe but if you believe you're a kafir so this is not something to be taken lightly it is totally prohibited to even come close to that uh, uh, venue Katie says is that true that Ibn Uthaymeen after he uh, heard the evidence on vaginal discharges from a doctor he changed his opinion saying that these discharges do not nullify ablution now what Katie asking about is the continuous uh, uh, wetness that a lot of women face Though this is not answering the call of nature, this is not something, it's, it's like uh, a discharge, but it's not due to illness. It's a discharge that is healthy. So, Sheikh ibn Aythimin, may Allah have mercy on his soul, says that this is pure. It is not najis. And it is like sweating. And the majority of women have it. In the early times, he used to say that this is pure, but a woman has to renew her wudu so whenever the time comes for a prayer and the adhan is called she has to make wudu and this is the same ruling of al-ma'zur a person who has continuous um, uh, urination uh, 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 passing of wind that never stops but the most authentic opinion and Allah Azza wa Jalla knows best that making wudu when the adhan is called doesn't change a thing Meaning that it's still continuous, and even if you make wudu, it's going to break. So the most authentic thing is that those who have this thing continuous with them, that is allegedly uh, uh, would break their wudu, it would not affect their wudu until they break their wudu with something else. So if someone like this sister who has continuous uh, vaginal discharges, and these are uh, normal for all women or most women. If she makes wudu for dhuhr and the adhan of asr is called and she did not nullify her wudu, she may pray. There's no problem in that. But if she passes wind, if she breaks her wudu with something else, in this case, she has to make wudu. But f with the, uh, um, the thing that she has ongoing 24-7, this doesn't affect her wudu, and Allah Azza wa knows best. Mujib from Bahrain. Mujib from Bahrain. Assalamu alaikum. Oh, Mujiba. Okay, sorry. Alaikum salam to Allah. Yes, Mujiba. Please ask me a question. Yes, what's your question? Uh, my question is regarding, so like, uh, Every month we have like fasting, like on 13th and 14th and 15th, yeah? Okay. So also we have like Monday and Saturday. So in one month, both of them, I can fast, no problem. Okay. Any more questions? Okay, the second, the second question is about Tahajjud or Kamil Layl. Okay. Okay, so here in Bahrain, 3.55, it is Fajr pray. So if I finish my praying at 3.10, it is the time, it is okay for me? Uh, what time is Fajr prayer? 3.45, as I'm saying, for Fajr. I finish in like 3 o'clock like this. For the time. Okay, okay. Okay, the first question is about if someone go in the Hajj and when they return back from Hajj, they give him the name of uh, the nickname, they call them Haji. Uh, for example, his name is Abdullah. When he comes back, they call him Haji Abdullah. It is uh, okay. permissible. Okay. Any more questions? No, I said gone. Thank you. Uh, okay. You're quite welcome. And we have Abu Huraira from Bangladesh. Salam to Allah. Salam to Uncle, I have a question. Uh, my question is, I have a colleague that uh, we work at night here in Bangladesh, based on the United States side. 
So what happens is during the last hour, we have a rule in our company stating that we cannot take a break on the last hour. But that's also the time we have, the fudger time. What happens with my colleague is that sometimes he prays before the adhan. Uh, is that prayer acceptable, even though I ask him why he keeps doing that? Can you please advise? Okay. I will answer you, inshallah. Okay. We have um, Sanu from Pakistan. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Assalamu My question is, I am going for Hajj, inshallah. Inshallah. So, um, I am expecting my periods on the day of Arafah. And if I have to leave Makkah, uh, how can I perform? The, I cannot perform tawaf e jara and I cannot extend my trip due to uh, the ticketing that we do. So what is the option for people who experience periods? Okay. I will answer you, inshallah. Jazakallah. Jazakallah. Okay, Mujiba from Bahrain, she is saying that, is it permissible to fast the white days, 13, 14, and 15 of every lunar month, plus Mondays and Thursdays? And the answer is definitely, yes, you are doing a great thing by fasting both. See, in fasting, the sky is the limit. However, the Prophet ﷺ made a limit for us, and he said that you may fast the fasting of the wood, peace be upon him, which is every alternate day. But you cannot fast more than that. So if you fast three days, the white days, and you fast Mondays and Thursdays, this is, these are eight days, most likely you will coincide one of the three days with a Monday and Thursday. So it's approximately 10 days a month. And this is a great thing for you to do and a, a great sunnah to follow. She says that I pray to Hajjud prayer, but I stop about 45 minutes before the Adhan of Fajr. Is this permissible? She says definitely yes. Not only that, it is the sunnah to stop before Fajr prayer and maybe sleep uh, or take a short nap because the Prophet ﷺ used to do this in the last one-sixth of the night he used to sleep before Fajr until uh, uh, Bilal comes and wakes him up or announces to him that uh, uh, Fajr is uh, approaching. So yes, there's no problem. You can pray the whole night or the last third of the night but you must offer your witter or refrain from praying just before the adhan of uh, Fajr. We have uh, Bila from Qatar. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Assalamu alaikum. Um, I would like to ask, I'm working here in Qatar. Mm -hmm. I would like to ask, I am unmarried, I'm single. Okay. And um, I would like to ask if I can go to Makkah or to Medina for my vacation because I have no parents anymore. Okay. Thank you so much. You're quite welcome. Okay, salam alaikum. Wa alaikum salam, flower kato. Um, we have Shamim from Saudi Arabia. Shamim? Shamim? Hello? Yes, yeah, Shamim. Salam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Salam alaikum wa barakatuh, akhi. Your line is breaking. Hello? Yes, akhi. Yeah, uh, Sheikh Asim, in one of your episodes during Ramadan, you said that uh, Isha prayer is one hour after Maghrib prayer. But normally, all over the Muslim countries, it is prayed one and a half hour after the Maghrib prayer. So which is correct? One hour after the Maghrib prayer or one and a half hour after the Maghrib prayer? Okay. Any more questions? No, thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Assalamu wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. And we have Um Aliya. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Alaikum salam to Allah. Sheikh, uh, say, uh, my question is uh, cutting short hair for ladies, small girls, is permissible less than their shoulders if their husband wants? Okay. Okay, Jazakallah. Wa Jazakum. Ahlan wa Sahlan. Okay, uh, Mujiba's last question. Uh, it's a custom in some countries when a person performs Hajj, when he comes back, they call him Hajji as a sign of uh, a new rank. So what's the, the ruling on that? This is um, uh, something to do with the custom. So I would not go to the extent to say that this is haram or a bid'ah or etc. But it is not recommended. It's like boasting about it. 
No one calls me because I pray five times a day uh, uh, in the masjid. No one says to me, uh, a musalli, Asim. No one says to me, muzakki, when I pay my zakat. No one say, sa'im. So why is it hajj when I go for that journey for five days or seven days and I come back, they call me hajji. This is sh uh, sort of showing off, but it, it's as a custom. And it's a sign of respect to the people because usually in these countries, those you would not call a person who is in his 20s hajji, though he, he had uh, performed his hajj. Usually this is, a title is given to someone who's like in uh, his 50s or in his 60s as a sign of respect. I would not uh, um, uh, say it's prohibited, but I would not recommend it as well. Abu Huraira from Bangladesh, he says that they are working the graveyard shift, which is usually from 11 o'clock until 7 o'clock. And the company policy does not allow them to take the break in the last hour. So his friend prays Fajr before the Adhan. Is, and he tells him that this is wrong. So w which one is right? No, definitely. Praying before the Adhan is not permissible because Allah Azza wa Jal prescribed the prayer at specific timing, timings. Allah says, Inna salata kanat ala al-mu'minina kitaban mawquta. That prayer has been prescribed at a specific time. So uh, it is not permissible at all for such a person to pray before the uh, uh, time of the prayer. So you have from the time of the Adhan and the last time to, for Fajr is when the sun starts to rise. The minute it rises, khalas, it's over the time. So if there is sufficient time for you to pray within this gap, then you should do that. But you definitely must not pray before the Adhan and you definitely must not pray after the sun rises. You have to pray on time, whether your job allows you or not. You have to uh, uh, improvise, you have to find a solution, prolong your working hours, have a deal with your manager, uh, do something, but you have to pray on time. Abu Muhammad from Bahrain. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. How are you, Sheikh? Everything's okay? Yeah, alhamdulillah, Rabbil uh, uh, Sheikh, I have one question. So, yes. my question is that I have borrowed some loan from my uncle a few years ago, and now he's died. So I want to know, to, do I have to give it back, this money, to his widow or his son, or can I make a charity or on behalf of his or something like that? Okay, any more that question? My question. Sorry, okay. uh, only one question, sir. Okay, my friend, I will answer you, inshallah. Thank, thank you very much. You're thank quite you. welcome, Uh Sano from Pakistan, uh, she says that she's planning for Hajj, inshallah, and according to her calculations, her menses will be on the day of Arafah. So if it takes five, six days, seven days, and as average, this means that on the 16th of the Hijjah, she would be able to perform the pillar of Hajj, which is Tawaf al-Ziyara, or Tawaf al-Hajj, or Tawaf al-Ifada, all for the same uh, uh, ritual, the three names. So she says, what can I do in this case? First of all, you have to try uh, if, if there are safe medications, for you to take to uh, stop uh, your menses. If this option is not possible, then the second optional must be yani, uh, taken into serious consideration, and that is to prolong your stay there until uh, maybe the 20th of the Hijjah. M more expenses, yes, but this is a one life uh, a shot. It is a, a, a ritual that is required once in a lifetime. So you have to uh, uh, figure out a way. If this is not uh, 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 possible and you have the third option, then the, uh, the third option would be that you go back to your country and you come after you finish your uh, menses. So if you go on the uh, 12th or the 13th of the Hijjah, come two weeks later and do your tawaf, do your sa'i, and your hajj would be uh, done. If this fourth, third option is not um, practical or possible, in this case, the last and final solution would be that you ensure that you are properly uh, taking your precautions and you can make your tawaf and sa'i with your menses due to necessity. And this is a fatwa 
of Sheikh Ibn Taymiyyah, may Allah be, uh, uh, have mercy on him, and also the fatwa of the scholars of Saudi Arabia for those who are unable to come with a proper solution. And this is something between you and Allah. Nobody's going to make a, a spot check on you to ensure whether you are pure or not. But this is something that you have to take all these necessary measures. And if none of them works for you, then the last one is your last resort. Uh, Abdul Qadir from Pakistan. Uh, hello, Sheikh. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, 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 actually, uh, uh, can I ask my question? I have three. Yes, what is your question, Abdul Qadir? Abdul Qadir? Hello? Yes, what is your question, Akhi? Thank you so much. Uh, uh, actually, I have a colleague that uh, he says he's a Muslim, uh, but he does not say his prayers uh, on time, you know. He, he tends to, you know, stay in a, in a very different time. Uh, what is... What is... Abdul Qadir. Uh, my wife, uh, I, uh, I don't know why, but she stopped saying prayers very lately. Yes. Okay, and, she doesn't uh, pray at all? Uh, she stopped like a month ago. She says, uh, apparently she prayed a lot to Allah, and Allah did not... Re okay. I will answer your question, inshallah. The line is not uh, uh, very healthy. Uh, Bila from Qatar, she says that she's a single woman and she works in Qatar and she would like to spend her vacation uh, to travel to Mecca and Medina. So what's the ruling on that? Bila, it's not my call. The Prophet وسلم, who you and I believe in said that it is not permissible for a woman to travel without, it's not permissible for a woman who believes in Allah and the Day of Judgment to travel without a mahram. A mahram meaning an adult a male who is related to her and she cannot marry him till death. Like a father, a brother, or a husband of course, uh, a son, an uncle, etc. Now this was said at the time of Hajj. So the Prophet والسلام, said this when a man was registered to go in a, a jihad while his wife went for Hajj, the, pro the Prophet ﷺ told him to leave the jihad and go accompany his wife because what she had done is not permissible. So if it is not permissible to travel for Hajj, which is a pillar of Islam, for a woman who doesn't have a mahram, in this case, it is not permissible for a woman to travel for anything else, whether it's work, tourism, education, trading, etc., anything else. So this is the fatwa of the Prophet ﷺ, and uh, um, Allah would re reward you for your intention. So if you intend to go for Umrah or for Hajj, and you're unable because you don't have a suitable mahram, because you have no one in your family to accompany you, in this uh, uh, case, Allah would reward you for your Hajj and for your Umrah, though you did not go because of your circumstances and your intention. And if you get married, that would be a, a, a good thing to do. We have a problem when it comes to marriage, and we are so picky. You shouldn't be. Yani for a, a, a boy who is suffering, and he's 18 years of age, and he wants to get married, and his family is not allowing him to, you can get married if you are between, uh, stuck between a rock and a hard place. And you say, either I get married or I fall into haram. In this case, yeah, go and get married. He said, no one would uh, marry me. He said, yeah, you will find someone who's 50 years old would marry you. And that would take the sin out of your mind. But you want someone to be like Miss Universe. And this is, uh, you, you have a problem here. So uh, my, my advice to those who are not married, let your uh, uh, bar a little bit down. Let your standard a little bit way down. And accept something that would save you from hellfire accept something that is not fully to your specs, but at least it takes sin away from you uh, with the grace of Allah. Shamim says that um, most countries pray Isha an hour and a half after Maghrib. Is this correct? The answer is no. This is definitely not correct. If you come from Medina heading to uh, Jeddah by car 
and you come at the time of Maghrib. And you can see, what well, because you're going in the direction of the west, Medina, to uh, uh, at some junction, though it's up north, but if you come in some certain areas, you would be headed towards the sea, and this is the west. You can see the sun set, setting. Once it sets, you can see the redness glowing in the direction of the west, in uh, the horizon. And this is a, 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 the redness that announces the time of Maghrib. Once this redness disappears, then this becomes pitch black, and this is the time of Isha. I've seen this myself. It took about 50 minutes or 55 minutes after sunset. So definitely, the time of Isha being quoted as one hour and a half is wrong. However, if you're unable to see the disappearance of the redness in the horizon, in this case, you cannot assume and jump to conclusions and pray Isha until you're certain that the time of Isha is due. And in cities, we cannot do this unless we have the adhan being called on Allah knows best. Abdul Aziz from Qatar. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Alaikum salam, rahmatullah. Uh, I have two questions. I'm, um... Abdul Aziz? Yeah, Abdul Aziz. We have a problem with the telephone lines. Abdul Aziz? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Hello, can you hear my, my voice? I can hear you now. What's your first question? Yeah, first question is if my sister don't. If your sister does not. With her. And my second question is. No, I didn't get your first question, yeah, Abdul Aziz. I didn't get your first question. If your sister does not do what? I think we uh, lost. My my second question. Okay. Uh, my second question. I think we have a problem with the line. Abdaziz, please uh, call again. Uh, um Alia, she says that what's the ruling on cutting the hair shorter than the shoulders level if the husband is requesting this? And that's just permissible. A woman can cut her hair as short as she wants, providing that she is not imitating uh, a kafir and she is not imitating men. Sometimes you find women uh, cutting their hair so short, if you look at them from behind, you think that this is a man. Now, this is haram. This is imitating uh, a man. And Aisha used to swear by Allah who honored and favored the women with long hair. So this is a privilege for women. But unfortunately, nowadays, with the new haircuts and with the media, Muslim women tend to look at actresses and look at kafir and would like to look alike. Um, husbands, unfortunately, may do the same, which is even a greater sin because they are ordered to lower their gaze. So uh, they say, I want you to have your hair cut like this uh, pop uh, star or like this rapper or like this uh, uh, actress, etc. And all of this is not permissible if that haircut is only done by kafir. But if it's a normal haircut and Muslim women all over the world are doing it, there's no problem in that as long as it's not imitating the men and Allah knows best. Abu Muhammad from Bahrain says, that he borrowed money from his uncle and then his uncle died. So should he give the money in charity? Should he return? No, definitely not, Akhi. You have no right in giving this money to charity. You must give the money back to the heirs of the deceased. So if he died leaving a wife, a son, a daughter, they have the right in that money. So it's their money now. You should give it to them and they distribute it according to the Islamic Sharia. Abdul Qadir from Pakistan says, I, the, the question is not clear because um, the line was breaking. So it was the line of Abdul Aziz from Qatar. And he said that his wife doesn't pray. And she left prayer, I think, a week or a month ago. And she said that she prayed to Allah, but Allah did not answer her um, prayer. So she abandoned prayer. If you're, you're talking about the five daily prayers, Ya Abdul Qadir, then there is a big problem. 
because the Prophet said alayhi salatu wasalam, uh, uh, he said that the pledge between us, the Muslims, and them, the disbelievers, is prayer. Whoever abandons prayer, he has committed an act of kufr. And in Sahih Muslim, the Prophet said alayhi salatu بين المرء بين الرجل والشرك أو الكفر between man and disbelief or associating others with Allah is the only thing that divides him uh, uh, and separates him from uh, kufr and shirk is abandoning salat. Abu Dawood added, so whoever abandons it, he has become a kafir. فقد كفر. Therefore, if your wife doesn't pray the five daily prayers and she confesses, she admits, she doesn't say, yes, yes, I prayed. This is different because you're not 24-7 with her. You go to the bathroom, she could have prayed. You go out to the masjid, she could have prayed. But if she says, no, I will not pray. I ask Allah Azza wa Jal for uh, five years to do something for me and he didn't do that for me. So I'm not praying at all. Then this is a problem. You should uh, uh, advise her. You should be strict with her. And if she insists, you should divorce her. Because she's not a Muslim anymore and you cannot remain married to such a person. But if she is talking about supplicating, which is a prayer, making dua, invoking Allah Azza wa Jal, she said, I'm not going to invoke Allah, this is a major sin. But she's still a Muslim, she has to be uh, taught properly uh, in the right uh, way. She has to adhere to the fact that she is a slave. She is a servant of Allah Azza wa Jal. She's not talking to a peer of hers. When you ask Allah, oh Allah, give me this, and Allah doesn't give me that, I'm not going to pray anymore. What, what is this? Do you think you have the ability to take a breath without Allah's permission? Do you think you can go to the bathroom and answer the call of nature if Allah does not allow you to? Are you insane? A single mosquito bite would put you in bed for Allah knows how long. Didn't you hear of Ebola? Didn't you hear of, of, of Mars or SARS or what, uh, Corona? All these illnesses, all these problems, all this hunger, all these thirst, all these blessings of Allah Azza wa Jal, it's all from Allah. And you think that you can address Allah Azza wa Jal as you address your friend or your colleague? Then definitely you're not a Muslim. Come back to your senses and know that you are here to be tested and tried. And if you fail, you go to hell straight for eternity. But if you pass, then Allah, and you're patient and tolerant, and you are submissive to Allah, and you show your humility, Allah Azza wa Jal, when He wills it, and when He sees that there is good for you in it, He will answer your call. Uh, Aisha from Nigeria. Aisha. Aisha from Nigeria. I don't know what's happening, but uh, so there seems, seems to be a problem with the phone calls. I hope Aisha calls back again. Um, a sister says that I have a problem. I get a lot of wiswas, illusions. Like when I'm sitting in the middle of a crowd, bad images about naked men, about gays, about lesbians. I try to avoid this, but I can't be sitting in the middle of a crowd and keep reciting "A'udhu Billahi Min Ash-Shaytanir Rajeem" or "Astaghfirullah." Please help me. I want to get rid of these bad illusions. I'm a dentist myself. If I don't, uh, uh, I don't watch por uh, porn stuff. First of all, these whispers are one of the hardest and most dangerous weapons of shaitan. Now the sister says that she doesn't watch porn. But I'm almost certain that she did watch porn or some of it for a portion of her life in the past. Nowadays she may not watch this, but she watch normal movies and watch normal uh, soap operas, etc. Meaning that she doesn't lower her gaze. And this is when shaitan seizes the chance and takes the moment. 
Because shaitan or the devil or Satan takes his time until you are ready to explore, until you're ready to fall. And once you're ready to fall, he puts his four full arson and he bombards you with doubts and desires and illusions. If you lower your gaze, these illusions would start to disappear, but not immediately. Because shaitan works on a long term. So once he sees that your iman is increasing, he increases his doubts. He increases his whispers and wishwas. He adds more spices to the meal so that he ensures that eventually you would fall in, your, in, in, in the trap. He never approaches you directly. He takes his time. So it seems to me that either you're fantasizing a lot, and this is why you're opening the, the back door for shaitan to come and to infest your mind. Or because you are trying to get closer to Allah Azza wa Jal, he is trying his level best to pull you down and not for you to progress in your quest to Allah Azza wa Jal. So keep on fighting, keep on saying Astaghfirullah al azim try to get married if you're not married, and cut all your intake of movies and soap operas uh, and the likes, and inshallah, you'll be in good hands. Uh, Nadia from Saudi. Hello, assalamu alaikum. Assalamualaikum. Sheikh, I have two questions. Yes. Uh, my first question, uh, actually I asked in the mail, I didn't receive the answer, so I want to repeat. Um, I, I asked actually in Ramadan about the fitya for my mother-in-law who is not fasting. And you told me that even after Ramadan we can uh, uh, call 30 people and give them the meal. So actually I wanted to ask, for example, if we don't find uh, 30 poor people together in one time, can we repeat the same 15, for example, if we have 15 people or 10 people, can we repeat uh, for them three days or two days meal uh, to complete 30 percent? And uh, this meal should be only one time or twice, uh, like because in a Ramadan we have sahur and aftar both. Okay. So we have to give only one meal to them or two meals? And second question? Uh, did you get? Yes, second uh, okay. question. And my second question is, uh, is uh, the father's uncle, uh, who is his mother's brother, he is mehram for a girl? Okay. Thank you very much. And we have Aisha from Nigeria. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Um, I have two questions, Sheikh. Yes. One is um, regarding, um, I know it's advisable for a Muslim when you're sitting idle, you should actually do zikr or reading of the Quran. So I want to see whether if there is a reward for watching like this for the TV, Islamic channels, instead of watching other channels. Is it also idle by watching the Islamic channels, you have to be reading your Quran constantly and zikr? Or you allowed to watch your friend's channel. Then the second thing is um, regarding um, writing on with kalam and there's this black ink they use in writing the Quran. Then it, it, they wash it off and then they give somebody to drink. Here in Nigeria, I've been asking from Shaitan, we say it's haram, some will say it's not. So this so is a form of healing, of, yeah, Aisha? A what? form of healing? Sorry, I don't get you. Is it a form of healing that you are doing this so that you can cure an illness by drinking it? Yes, at times for illness, illness or pregnancy for women, they do, right? Okay. Then from, yeah, yeah. Okay. So I want to know whether it's actually permissible to do so or not. Okay, I will answer you, inshallah. Thank you very much. You're quite welcome. Yeah. Nadia from Saudi Arabia, she says that uh, her mother-in-law did not fast and uh, due to old age or to illness, and she uh, wants to give the expiation, which is feeding a poor person for every day missed. So is it two meals or one meal? The answer is one meal. So if you cook a lot of food and you inv invite 30 people to eat from it, this does the job. Now she says that it's difficult to find 30 people, so can we invite 10 people and feed them uh, three different meals? The answer is yes, this is permissible, inshallah, because for every day you have to feed one poor person. You can feed 
one poor person for 30 days and this would do the job for the whole month of Ramadan Allah knows best Abdul Qadir from Qatar Salam alaikum Sheikh Shantullah Yeah, uh, I want to my, uh, ask my second question uh, and it is uh, one of my children become sick and I can't uh, buy drugs uh, and <clears throat> Uh, but at the same time, uh, I see the kingdom Salman went to the beach travel with Saudi This is nothing, this is nothing to do Saudi with the question, yeah, uh, Abdul Qadir. Than, Forget yeah. this. The, uh, okay, Nadia says that how many meals? One meal. Fatur or suhoor? No. You just give one single meal and this is sufficient, inshallah. The second question um, is that the uncle of the father is he a mahram to a woman the answer is yes your father's paternal uncle or maternal uncle is your mahram this is understood inshallah and the fa the, the the brother of your grandfather who is the uncle of your uh, father the same thing but your husband's uncle is not related to you and he's not a mahram as so many Muslims think. So this is uh, uh, clear, inshallah. Aisha from Nigeria, she says that her first question I wasn't able to understand, but it seems that she's asking if I watch Islamic um, TV uh, uh, channels where they recite the Quran and they teach hadith and sunnah and there are social programs that they bring Muslims back to their religion. Am I being rewarded? And the answer is definitely yes. You are rewarded because whatever goodness you listen to from the Quran and from the Sunnah, this is the word of Allah Azza wa Jal and the teachings of the Prophet ﷺ. So you are definitely doing dhikr and Allah would reward you for that. And her second question was about writing the Quran and then washing the writing with water and drinking it. Is this permissible? Some scholars say that this is permissible in the case of ruqya. So if a person has a, a, a spell, a magical spell, a sorcerer uh, casted a spell on him, or he has an evil eye or um, jinn possession, etc., they say that writing the uh, verses of the Quran of ruqya with saffron and then washing it and drinking it or washing the body with it, or taking uh, uh, lots of uh, leaves, uh, seven of them, and, and, and grinding them, and then doing the same and drinking it. This has uh, uh, a lot of good in it, uh, inshallah, as a means of curing. As for pregnancies, this is not an illness. So I can not say uh, that it would work, and Allah Azza wa knows best. Rayyan from Saudi. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu rahmatullah. Uh, sir, I have two questions. Yes, sir. Uh, first question is, uh, is it permissible to say Ya Rasulullah like we say Ya Allah? Do, for what? The, Doing that for what, Ya Rayyan? Like usually we say Ya, ya Rasulullah. Before Ya Rasulullah, we say Ya, ya Rasulullah like we say ya, ya Allah. No, why do you say Ya Rasulullah? Are you addressing the Prophet? You're asking him for something? Hello? Yes, Rayyan. Rayyan? Hello? Yes, 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 yes. Are you asking the Prophet something, Akhi? Yes, yes, yes. What are you asking him? Hello? Okay, I think, Ray Rayyan, if you call us again, I, I would appreciate that. Sayyid says, some people say, that the Dajjal will have a palace on Jabal Habshi in the outskirts of Medina and that is a place that has been and there is a place that has been built there recently what are your thoughts on this and does this mean anything thank you first of all yani some people say how would i verify this and they said that the Dajjal would have a house in Jabal Habshi. Now, where did they get this from? Is it from an authentic hadith, first of all? Second of all, some people say 
This is not part of our Islamic beliefs or etiquettes to depend on uh, uh, rumors or hearsay and uh, whatever people um, delegate and, 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 and mention in their gatherings. On the contrary, the Prophet ﷺ forbade this and he said, كَفَى بِالْمَرْءِ إِثْمًا أَنْ يُحَدِّثَ بِكُلِّ مَا سَمِعْ It is sufficient burden and sin that a person would speak with everything that he hears. So many people call and say, this person did this, that person did that, all things that are not related to reality. Yaqi, did you see this yourself? No, but I heard people say. I googled uh, uh, Wikipedia and they said that this is confirmed. Subhanallah. It is one of the signs of the approaching of the Day of Judgment when a liar is believed and the man saying the truth is being accused of lying. This is a, a, an authentic hadith where the Prophet told us about it So, the Prophet said and And this roughly translates to that it is one of the most hated and abhorred uh, um, uh, ways of speaking to say or to begin what you want to say by saying I heard people say they claim that this and this so I could come and begin anything any topic by relieving myself from responsibility and I say to uh, brother uh, Sayyid uh, brother Sayyid and I hear people say that you're gay akhi. and I don't know astaghfirullah what you, what are your thoughts about this is this, is this acceptable now you're basing your allegation upon what people say, upon a hadith that the Dajjal would take a palace in Jabal Habshi or Hibshi or whatever at the outskirts of Medina. Do you know where that place is? No. Have you seen it? No. Is it confirmed that the Prophet said this? I don't know. They say, subhanAllah. Have you uh, 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 seen that the place does not take any other palaces around it? So how can you build any uh, argument uh, on this? Therefore, we should not pay any attention to such uh, um, yani rumors or cheap talk that doesn't add any value. We believe that the jail is coming and he would be, be prevented from entering uh, Mecca and Medina. So the palace you're talking about being built there at Jabal Habshi, do you think that the people are yani, uh, furnishing uh, his accommodation in anticipation of his uh, uh, coming? This is not uh, uh, logical. Fatima from Gambia. <laughs> Fatima from Gambia. Yes, yeah, salam alaikum. Salam wa rahmatullah. Um, we need to ask, can you first I, I cannot understand your question, Fatima. Mute your TV, please, and talk to me from the phone. Yeah, okay. Relaxing, um, if you can. Okay. Yes, Fatima. What is your question? If you can first show while on Saturday. Okay. I will answer, inshallah. Okay. Um, okay, Rayan's question wasn't clear, but he was saying or asking about saying Ya Rasulullah. Now, in Arabic, Ya is known as Harfun Nida. It's a preposition uh, used to address something. It's like the O, when we say O oh Allah, when we address Allah. So, Ya is used to address a person. When I want to call a friend of mine, his name is Abdullah, I said, Ya Abdullah. Or if I want to call the uh, uh, crane operator who's uh, uh, operating the, the camera, I say, Ya Khalid Eid, for example. So I'm addressing him. I'm saying, Ya. Now, if someone says, Ya Rasulullah, and he's addressing, to the, addressing the Prophet, we have a problem. If it's talking to the Prophet or asking the Prophet, this is shirk. If it's part of the supplication, this is okay. 
So this is not addressing the Prophet ﷺ, as in the case of the tahiyyat. <coughs> we say, At-tahiyyatu lillahi wa salawatu wa tayyibat. As-salamu alayka ayyuhal nabi. Or, As-salamu ala nabi wa rahmatullah. So this is not addressing the Prophet ﷺ. I'm not addressing him or talking to him because this would be shirk in the salah. This is invocation. This is the dua. It's something totally different and not related. But now when someone says, Ya Rasulullah, Ya Rasulullah, as they do in Nasheed, Ah, you have a problem, Akhi. Are you talking to the Prophet? He said, no, 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 I'm not addressing him. So why are you using the preposition, Ya? Why are you saying, O Prophet of Allah, don't you see what's happening to us? No, he doesn't. Why are you addressing him? This is shirk, this is kufr. You should refrain from that. And this is why we have to know if someone addresses the Prophet by saying, Ya Rasulullah, what does he mean by that? Fatma from Gambia, she, she says that what's the ruling on fasting? The six days of Shawwal and one of the days is a Friday. So what's the problem? She says the problem is that the Prophet forbade us from singling out Friday. And the hadith is in the Sahih. When he went to his, uh, one of his homes and he saw his wife fasting on a Friday. So he asked her, did you fast yesterday? She said, no. She, he said to her, are you fasting tomorrow, which is a Saturday? She said, no, which meant that she's singling Friday alone. The Prophet told her, break your fast. So the scholars say that breaking uh, or fasting Friday, singling it out on voluntary days without any reason is totally prohibited. But the, if there is a reason, such as making up for a missed day, such as Arafah, Ashura, or the six days of Shawwal, and if you single it out, then this is not because of a Friday, because of what you're doing. This is permissible, inshallah. Samra from uh, Saudi. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I have a question. Yes. I, I'm a doctor, and I'm married uh, 22 years, and my husband is not happy with me especially in the physical relations, and I tried my best, and I know that a lady, he, she, if she, her husband is not happy with her, she will not enter Jannah. I tried my best, but now the things got worse, and slowly and gradually I develop that I, uh, that I f feel hatred toward this relationship. I ask, I try to make up. I ask him if he wants to marry another lady, he can marry. And if he wants to get something, I can give everything with me, I can give him. So whatever he wants, if he wants to divorce, he can even do. But really, I'm very much worried. May Allah not be happy with me. And I tried my best and I can't do anything and it's not, not, not working. Don't anything. worry. Don't worry. I will answer you. Any more yeah. questions? Thank you, doctor. Thank no you. problem, inshallah. Uh, we have uh, Ayman from the Philippines. No, Salam alaikum, Sheikh. Salam to Allah. No, in Baljurashi, Saudi. In Baljurashi? Oh, it's, it's close by yeah. to, to the Philippines, no problem. Uh, uh, Sheikh, I want to ask something about my colleague, uh, Filipina. He converts, uh, referred to Islam. Okay. Then uh, I, I told him to, because she's married uh, in Philippines, she has a husband and a uh, daughter. So, I, uh, I, somebody told me that uh, she cannot, uh, she, if she go to Philippines, she cannot have uh, marital sex, right? She has to what, Akhi? Uh, yani, yani, uh, marital sex, for marriage. For, for with uh, her husband, who is a, who's a Christian? Yeah, but he's Muslim. Okay, I will answer, I will answer you, inshallah. Why, but there is a nice answer. Uh, okay, inshallah, I will answer you. Okay, we have two minutes, so uh, let's fire, uh, inshallah. Uh, Samra from Saudi Arabia, she says that she's a doctor for 25, 22 years. She's married. Her husband is not happy with her, especially when it comes to uh, issues of intimacy. She offered him to get married. She offered him to do whatever she is capable to do, but he's still unhappy with her. In this case, this if... It is your husband's shortcomings. If he's the one who's not ever pleased, and it is him who is falling short of uh, uh, doing his duties, yet he's complaining and nagging, and like a lot of the husbands would do, put you in uh, uh, under the spot of uh, uh, spotlight, making you feel 
uh, the guilt. No, the, the, Allah is not unhappy with you. As long as you're doing whatever you can to please Him and to uh, uh, um, satisfy His needs and to obey His instructions, but He's still not happy. He cannot uh, uh, do anything about this. And He's the one who's the aggressor and He's the one who's doing zulm on you. So you have no problem in doing that. You don't have to be so worried or tensed because you have done all what you can and Allah would only judge you for what you can. So don't have any problems with that. If you can get someone to counsel both of you, so you tell him, okay, let's get someone uh, uh, from outside, a third person who would judge and listens to, uh, would listen to both of us and can pinpoint the problem and says, no, Akhi, you as a husband, you're wrong, or you as a wife, you're wrong, then that would be much better. Ayma from Baljur, she says that a woman, alhamdulillah, reverted to Islam. She has a husband back in the Philippines and a daughter. So what's the ruling on her uh, going back and living with her husband? This is totally prohibited. As long as he's a kafir, he's a disbeliever, he's a Christian, once she accepts Islam, the marriage contract is dissolved. They are not related anymore. He's not related to her. He is an mahram She cannot live with him. She cannot meet with him. She cannot stay with him. If he accepts Islam, alhamdulillah, they can go back together without any problem. But as she is a Muslim, she must not have any kind of communication with him. Now, if she's here, she could call him, send him SMSs, uh, invite him to Islam. If he is uh, uh, reciprocating, alhamdulillah, if he's not, if he's defiant, in this case, she should do the legal uh, uh, ways and means to stop this. And the final question is from uh, Umar. He says, what are the limitations between a girl and her fiancé? How should they behave to one another? A fiancé is not your mahram. He is not your husband. The marriage contract has not been signed. So he's a total stranger to you. You should not communicate. You should not SMS, chat, uh, uh, share uh, books, WhatsApp, it's, uh, app, etc. No. He's a total stranger. Once the marriage contract is written, then he is your husband. The sky is the limit. This is all the time we have until we meet next week. Same time. I leave you. Fi amanillah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allah is my heart's speech, your mercy is what I beseech, keep in my heart your remembrance and in your deeds.